Welcome back, and thank you for listening to Xenozoic Xenophiles, a fan podcast devoted to the comic series Xenozoic Tales, a post-apocalyptic adventure series filled with Cadillacs and dinosaurs. From creator, writer, and artist Mark Schultz, I'm Darren. And I'm Ruth. And this is a fan podcast. We're not affiliated with Mark Schultz, and the opinions expressed are just ours. We're doing this podcast because we truly enjoy reading and talking about the worlds of Xenozoic Tales created by Mark Schultz. In this episode, we're covering Xenozoic Tales, Issue 5, from February 1988. It features a 20-page story written and illustrated by Mark Schultz, and an 8-page story written by Mark Schultz and illustrated by Steve Stiles. And later in the episode, we'll talk about the great experience we had meeting Mark Schultz at Baltimore Comic Con, and we'll share some of the great feedback we've received since last time. We've mentioned our title in the past, but we'll quickly mention it here for any new listeners. Of course, Xenozoic is part of the title of the comic. Xeno is defined as something that is strange, different, or foreign, while Zoic refers to a geological period of time. So Xenozoic basically means strange era. And a xenophile is someone who is interested in foreign lands and foreign cultures. That word describes us perfectly because we're always interested in foreign lands and cultures like those found in Xenozoic Tales. Of course, many of you might be more familiar with this series under the title Cadillacs and Dinosaurs. The original series, created, written, and primarily illustrated by Mark Schultz, started with a backup short story in the anthology comic Death Rattle in 1986, and then ran under the title Xenozoic Tales for 14 issues from 1987 to 1996 from Kitchen Sink Press. In 1990, Marvel's Epic Comics reprinted the first six issues of the black and white series in color using the title Cadillacs and Dinosaurs. In 1993, there was a Saturday morning cartoon series, again using the title Cadillacs and Dinosaurs, that ran for a single season. And there were three short miniseries published by Topps Comics based on the TV series that were primarily written by Roy Thomas working with various artists. And this is an exciting time to be revisiting the series. Because after 20 years, Mark Schultz is working on a new Xenozoic Tales graphic novel. If you like the series, be sure to join the Facebook page, Mark Schultz Xenozoic Tales and Other Stories, for all of the latest news and information. If you don't have the series but want to pick it up, there are some options. In addition to the individual issues, there have been several trade paperback collections over the years, including a recent collection simply titled Xenozoic. It contains all of the stories written and illustrated by Mark Schultz. It's a wonderful oversized collection printed on high-quality paper and is available with two gorgeous covers. And if you would like some music to listen to while reading the series, then consider picking up Songs from the Xenozoic Age. It's an eclectic mix of fun songs by Chris Christensen. They're inspired by the series, and the CD features album art by Mark Schultz. We really enjoy sharing listener feedback and being part of all the fun exchanges with listeners on social media. Please feel free to write in anytime and let us know what you think about the series. I'd love to know what you like best about the art and stories or how you first discovered Xenozoic Tales. We'll provide our email address and other ways to contact us at the end of the episode. And if you like the show, please consider checking out our other podcasts that are available on iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play. Trekker Talk is a fan podcast devoted to the adventures of 23rd century bounty hunter Mercy St. Clair from the pages of the sci-fi comic Trekker by creator, writer, and artist Ron Randall. And Warlord Worlds is a fan podcast devoted to the comic creations of writer and artist Mike Grell, including The Warlord, John Sable, and Green Arrow. Ron Randall, Mike Grell, and Mark Schultz are our three favorite comic creators. Their stories are always filled with adventure and interesting characters, and their art is excellent. We'll include links to those other podcasts in our show notes, but for now, let's dig into this month's issue. Xenozoic Tales, Issue 5 February 1988. Editor, Dave Shiner. Letters, Denise Prowl. Publisher, Dennis Kitchen. Production, Jan Manweiler. Original color covers by Ray Fehrenbach. Reprint edition, cover colors by Denise Prowl. Interior colors by Randall Burnt and Ray Fehrenbach. It's the early 26th century. The world has undergone great geological upheavals, creating global catastrophes. Few people survived. Those that did found themselves living in isolated tribes in a very different world, in a strange ecosystem. It's a new age known as the Xenozoic Era. The original cover features a spectacular underwater image of Jack Tenrick and Hannah Dundee. Jack is holding a knife, and both look wary and on the defense as a large creature swims past them. The blue and gray colors make the scene look moody and ominous. And I think the reprint cover is equally spectacular. Jack and Hannah are leaping from a moving Cadillac that is racing off the end of a dock. As our two heroes plunge into the water, a giant mosasaur is leaping out of the water as though it's going to attack the Cadillac. 
Excursion, written and illustrated by Mark Schultz. The story opens in the city in the sea. Jack is pounding on a door, and as the door opens, we see it's Hannah Dundee's room. A trustworthy source has told Jack that she took a 20th century science book from the library when they were in the vaults two days earlier. Hannah recoils in shock at the accusation and refutes the claim. With all of the volumes lost in the flood, why would the governing council think she took one book? Jack barges in and begins to search her room. He isn't there on behalf of the governing council. He's just following up on a lead and wants to prevent her from getting hold of a book of science. During his search, he finds a strange net and asks about it. She explains it's a Triton net, and it's part of the exchange program between the city and the sea in Wasoon. She is showing fishermen in the city how to build these types of nets. Jack thinks it's worthless because Tritons aren't edible. She tells him he doesn't know everything and agrees to show him how to use the net. Anything to get him out of her room. At the dock, as the two are preparing their boat, Governor Dahlgren walks up to them to explain that the moles have all been rotated to the surface to help reintegrate them into the city instead of the isolated community they had developed by staying underground for so long. As Jack and Hannah head out onto the open sea, they notice that another boat is following them at a discreet distance. It seems the governing council doesn't trust either of them any longer. They've been involved in too many suspicious situations recently, including the death of Governor Gorgostomos and the flooding of the vaults. Out on the sea, Hannah tells Jack about Wasoon, which is built on the ruins of a city of white marble that is now part of a large marshy salt fin. Their tribe consists of many mighty hunters, skilled fishermen, and educated scholars. However, since the old city was completely destroyed by the cataclysm, there are no books, no great library like the one in the City in the Sea. It is the knowledge in the library that Wasoon wants in exchange for the hunting and fishing skills she is bringing to the city. This revelation makes Jack realize that Hannah knew about the library all along and manipulated him to get inside. Just as he starts to lose his temper, Hannah diffuses the situation by using her boating skills to shift the sail, tipping Jack into the sea. As Hannah leans over the boat with a wry smile on her face, an amused Jack taunts her from the water. The two anchor their boat and take a small raft into the marshes. Hannah shows Jack how to set out the nets. She explains that Tritons spend their early years in the marshes, and here the ones they find will be tender and good to eat. Their conversation turns to the Grith, and Jack wonders if Hannah read anything about them while she was in the library, but she didn't find any mention of them. Hannah tells Jack the library was filled with lots of information, but very little wisdom. Just then, a giant creature erupts from under the water, upturning the small raft. Hannah sinks into the marshy water, where she is attacked by a giant creature with large claws. Jack swims in with his knife in hand and saves Hannah from the creature, but is knocked unconscious as he tries to swim away. Thankfully, the recovered Hannah is able to pull him to shore and resuscitate him. Following their near-death experiences, she admits to him that she did take the book from the library. She didn't intentionally steal it, but just picked it up as it floated by her in the flooding vaults. However, when she later tried to look at the book in her room, it crumbled away in her hands from exposure to the surface atmosphere. Back in their small raft, Jack steers them to their boat following a different route and brings them up behind the boat that's been following them. As they pass by, they toss a sack of freshly caught tritons into the boat and tell the two men watching them to take the so-called evidence back to the governing council. Back in their own boat, Hannah asks now that she's shown Jack how to fish, when is he going to show her how to drive? I really like the interplay between Jack and Hannah in this issue. From the very beginning of the series, we've seen them bicker at times and laugh at times, but their characters take center stage in this story. Yes, there's an adventure, and yes, there's a monster, but the real substance of the story is character interaction between Jack and Hannah, and it's perfect. The two both have such strong personalities that it's expected that they will argue at times, but their grudging respect for each other keeps shining through, and it's obvious they are developing feelings for each other. The opening page of The City and the Sea is spectacular, from the lush vegetation on the edge of the city to the crumbling skyscrapers in the distance. It's a gorgeous page to start the story. 
The interplay of shadows and light are extraordinary throughout the issue and really make it look like a moody film noir movie. The scenes of the boat at sea are great. Waves are crashing and several different angles are used, creating the feeling of the boat pitching and rolling on the water. Everything is illustrated so well, the figures are all realistic, and expressions on faces convey just the right emotions for the story. The creature is perfectly timed as the casual conversations between Jack and Hannah have created a relaxed mood between the two characters, and their mood is certainly rudely interrupted. And my favorite line in the story is when Hannah describes the library as being filled with lots of information, but very little wisdom. That's an even more relevant statement today as the internet floods us with information, but little wisdom seems to accompany that information. This was a really great issue, but then aren't they all? Ladies and gentlemen, this is the worst comic podcast ever. I'm Jerry. I'm John. I'm Cullen. And we do news, reviews, and interviews dealing with the world of comics. You can find us on social media, on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, or our email, worstcomicpodcastever at gmail.com. And this is a podcast 30 years in the making. This is the worst comic podcast ever. Dog's Life, written by Mark Schultz, illustrated by Steve Stiles. At the start of the story, we are introduced to Takura. He is a farm dog, stock dog, guard dog, hunting dog, and retriever, all in one. With a pat on the head, he heads out in the morning with the sheep. They pass the stockyard and head to the grassy hills beyond. He spends the day protecting the sheep from predators, including pteranodons and large snake-like reptiles. A local pack of wolves come close to the flock, but never close enough to unnerve the sheep. They would never cross Takura, but they call out to him in the hopes that he will join them one day. At the end of the day, he rounds up the sheep and returns them to the corral, and he receives his reward of a friendly pat on the head and a good meal. That night, the wolves call out to him again, as they often do, but then he catches a scent. It is a cutter what we know as an allosaurus, trying to sneak in downwind to get to the flock of sheep. <coughs> Takura begins to bark to wake the farmers and then attacks the cutter to divert it from the flock. Jaws full of sharp teeth snap and claws and talons swipe at each other. The farmers arrive and fire their guns and the cutter races away into the dark. Takura continues to bark and growl as the farmers notice the deep injury on his side. The farmers gingerly bandage him, and he lays down for some much-needed rest, before he will start fresh again the next day. It's all in a day's work in the life of a farm dog. This is such a sweet little story, and another example of how nicely these backup stories give us some insight into the rest of the world of Xenozoic Tales. The art is great. The landscapes are varied from fields to mountains to dried-up riverbeds. I love how the story creates a fully developed character out of this dedicated little farm dog, he is heroic and noble. There was an ominous feeling throughout the story, and you knew all along that something was going to happen. And I was honestly worried about Takura throughout the whole story. In the end, I was so happy that our vigilant little farm dog lived to see another day. And in case you're interested, Takura is a word that originates from the north of Spain, meaning something similar to a prairie dog. Ashford, what is straight out of Gallifrey? Straight Outta Gallifrey is a podcast where Josh and I talk about Doctor Who episodes, classic and new, featuring other Time Lords as well as the Doctor. There are other Time Lords? Oh yes. It started all the way back with the first Doctor, William Hartnell. Oh yeah, you told me about that. The Time Meddler. That's correct, Kirsten. Where can I find the episodes? You can always go to straightoutagallifrey.lipson.com. I don't think I'll remember that. Just add us on Twitter. We are so Gallifrey, like S O Gallifrey. Twitter feeds move too fast. I always miss stuff. Well, subscribe to us on iTunes. That way, every time we upload a new episode, you will get the alert on your smarting device. Cool. Thanks. I can't wait to listen. Okay, Kirsten. See you later. Why are you walking into that blue box? I'm going to have a couple of drinks with Mother Teresa of Calcutta. See ya. <laughs> You always say that. Whoa. It is real. So he does have drinks with Mother Teresa of Calcutta.
Let's talk a bit about who's who and what's what in Xenozoic Tales. This is the 26th century, long after a series of geological cataclysms. What is known as the city in the sea in these stories is the island of Manhattan and is now partially submerged in the ocean. The city of Wasoon is what we know as Washington, D.C. Jack Tenrick is an old blood mechanic, one of the few people who have learned how to repair the many machines left over from the distant past. While he can be gruff at times, he is more respected by residents than the governors who run the city. Hannah Dundee is a scientist and ambassador from Wasoon who has come to the city in the sea in the hopes of building cooperation between the two cities. The Grith are mysterious humanoid reptiles and are allies of both Jack and Hannah, who are two of the very few people who have ever seen the Grith. The Grith communicate telepathically with each other and talk to Jack using the letter tiles from an old Scrabble board game. The Governing Council rules the city and the sea and consists of several members, including Governor Dahlgren, who appears in this story. She is the only female member of the council that we've met so far. Next up is listener feedback, when we share the emails and other messages we've received since last time. Thanks to everyone for the comments. Your support and encouragement is great, and we sincerely appreciate everyone who took the time to get in touch to share your thoughts. We got some great comments as soon as our last episode posted. Vic Sage, writer for The Retroist, called out, Quahoon, the latest episode of Xenozoic Xenophiles is available. And John Baker wrote, going to get my listen on, and not long after, he followed up to say how much he enjoyed the episode. And Paul Hicks from Waiting for Doom was excited as well, saying it will be the first thing I will listen to on my drive home today. And Ryan Daly of the Secret Origins podcast and Power of Fishnets let us know he enjoyed the latest episode as well. Thanks, Ryan. Chris Mounts frequently posts about films and podcasts, and he commented that he was catching up on podcasts, and as he was whittling away at the geek and comic ones, Chris said the top three he heard this week have to go to Ruth and Darren for achieving the trifecta with Xenozoic Xenophiles. He added, if you guys do a Steve Rude's Nexus, Tim Truman's Grimjack, or Mike Gustavich's Justice Machine podcast, I might die of euphoria. Interestingly, my brother's all-time favorite comic is Nexus. Maybe I should ask him to do a podcast about that. We did get a chance to meet Steve Rude and Mike Barron a few years ago, and I was able to get a book signed for my brother. Now that made the best present for him. We were very fortunate to meet Mark Schultz in person at Baltimore Comic Con since the last episode. He was very kind to us and very generous with his time with us. We had a great conversation with him about everything from comics to the beauty of black and white films to the comedy of Buster Keaton. He was also very happy to sign the books for the lucky winners of our recent contest. We are very excited to share that he offered to do an interview with us for the podcast. We can't wait for the chance to speak with him again and to learn more about his return to Xenozoic Tales. That will truly be a special episode. And I want to add a special thanks to Ange of the Supergirl Comic Box Commentary. Ange met Mark Schultz at this year's Boston Comic Con and told him about this podcast. So when we met Mark Schultz, we were amazed to learn that he had been listening to the show. That was thrilling and a little intimidating. We'll have to be on our best behavior. It was a fantastic day all the way around, and so wonderful to meet Mark Schultz. He's such a great guy. And Scott Connor saw the photo of us with Mark Schultz that we had posted online and said, Nice to see you finally got a chance to meet him. Scott is one of our earliest listeners and a big fan of Mark Schultz. We've become friends with him through the podcast, and we're actually fortunate to meet him at a convention during the summer where we had a fun conversation about Xenozoic Tales. Interestingly, we learned that Mark Schultz is a friend of Ron Randall's, who was also at the Baltimore show. Ron Randall is the creator, writer, and artist for the comic Trekker about sci-fi bounty hunter Mercy St. Clair, and we do a podcast about that comic called Trekker Talk. It was great to learn that two of our all-time favorite comic creators are friends, and they even shared with us that they went out to dinner together while they were at the Baltimore show. Of course, that made us think about how much fun it would be if the two of them did a crossover print that somehow featured Mercy St. Clair teaming up with Hannah and Jack. Wouldn't that be fun to see? Also, while we were at Baltimore Comic-Con, we met Tim Wallace of Cord Industries, a Blue Beetle blog, as well as the Phantom Skull Cave blog. This was our first time meeting Tim, but he was easy to spot because he came dressed as none other than Ted Cord, complete with awesome sunglasses, driving gloves, and a Blue Beetle shirt. We had a chance to talk about the brand new Blue Beetle Rebirth comic. He did a great article about it on his blog, and we'll put it in the show notes so you can check it out. He's a great guy, and we really enjoyed our conversations with him and hope to meet up with Tim again at another con in the future. And we were very happy to catch up with our friend Mike of the Comics in the Golden Age podcast at the convention. He is terrific and knows so much about so many comics, and his comic collection is remarkable. 
He has shared photos of it on the Comics in the Golden Age Facebook page. We enjoyed meeting his lovely wife and one of his daughters, who were also at the convention. They were having an outstanding day, in part because they had just met Haley Atwell, the star of Agent Carter, and got her autograph. We recently picked up a copy of The Modern Masters, Volume 15, featuring Mark Schultz. It's an excellent book filled with Mark's beautiful art throughout. There is an extensive bio interview by Fred Perry and Eric Nolan Wethington that any fan of Mark Schultz will enjoy. Tomorrow's is the publisher, and they have a great online preview of the book available. We'll include the link in our show notes so you can take a look. You can get a feel for the book and how the art is intermixed with the interview. And if you're interested, you can order the book directly from them. And speaking of amazing art, Josh Jensen shared a picture with us of the terrific coloring job he did on a Mark Schultz sketch. Josh is already a terrific colorist, and he is working to improve his skills even more. His Twitter posts include lots of practice work. Just scroll through, and you may find some of your favorite characters turning up in the beautiful colors by Josh. You must really check out his Twitter feed, so we'll include a link in our show notes. As we mentioned earlier, Mark Schultz signed the books for the prize winners of our recent contest, and we let the winners know their books were in the mail. But we didn't expect to get so many laughs in return, as Paul, Alan, Clinton, Joe, and Ed all shared a rapid-fire series of jokes about having to wait for their books to arrive. Of course, being in Australia, Paul will have the longest wait, as his package travels halfway around the globe. But since he's one of the hosts of the podcast Waiting for Doom, he's had lots of practice waiting. And we felt like prize winners ourselves when we opened a package from Mark Sweeney. He surprised us with awesome t-shirts with the logo of his podcast, I'm the Gun. We thanked him and let him know we'd be wearing them to our next convention, and he replied that we'd no doubt be a shoe-in to win Best Dressed Duo at this year's Casties Award. And lastly, I'd like to mention that I discovered a terrific podcast interview that Wendy Freeman of the Double Page Spread podcast conducted with Mark Schultz. They cover a lot of topics, including the writing he has done for Prince Valiant and Superman, his illustrated book Storms at Sea, and of course, Xenozoic Tales. Just check out the show notes for a link. While you are there, take a close look at her other episodes. She has done a lot of interesting interviews with people in the comics industry. Recent ones include Steve Lieber and Mike Grell. Next, we want to extend our thanks to everyone who supported the show on social media since last episode. These are people who liked or shared posts from us on Twitter, Tumblr, or Facebook. Your support helps draw attention to the podcast, and we sincerely appreciate all that each of you do. Before we start, let us say if we miss a name, please let us know, and we'll correct it in the next episode. And also forgive us if we mispronounce your name. Just email us and let us know, and we'd be happy to correct that next episode, too. Andre Moore, Ange of the Supergirl Comic Box Commentary Blog, Ashford of Feathers and Foes and Straight Out of Gallifrey, BC Fan 101, Billy Hogan, Brian Mulvey, Chris Mounts, Clinton Robison of the Coffee and Comics blog, Comics in the Golden Age with Mike and Chris, Cullen Stapleton of the Worst Comics Podcast Ever, in name only, Daniel Simonson, Dr. G. Man of Nerdology of the Pulp to Pixel Podcast, Ed Terry and Nick Moore of Till Productions, Eric Mannix of Out of the Fridge and Pages for All Ages, J.R. Horror Brian, Jacob Sindic, J. Jones, J. Olson, Joe Crawford of the blog for the Non-Discerning Reader, Joe Sullivan, John Baker, John Holloway, also of the worst comic podcast ever, Jolie Eccles, Josh Jensen, Karen Williams of Between the Pages, Casey Carlisle, Kurt Cooper, Kurt Rain, Kyle Benning of King Size Comics Giant Size Fun, Larry Looper Jr., a.k.a. The Question at Vic Sage, and writer for The Retroist and host of Radio Memories Podcast, Leo Acton, Matthew Biggs, Michael Lane, Mike Ratliff, Monsters and Mystics, Neil Patel, Nicholas Prom of Comic Reflections, Orrin Faw, Paul Hicks of the Waiting for Doom podcast, Professor Allen of the Relatively Geeky Podcast Network, Reagan Hartrip, Rick Como, Ryan Daly of the Power of Fishnets and Secret Origins and many other podcasts, Scott Connor, Sean Vogt, Talk Nerdy to Me, Tim Wallace of the Cord Industries Blue Beetle blog, Tony Greenall, Weird Science DC, Wendy Friedman of the podcast Double Page Spread, and Xavier Jack. Before we go, we want to provide our contact information. Please let us know your thoughts through email, Facebook, or Twitter. 
You can reach us at xenozoicxenophiles at gmail.com or follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Tumblr under the name Xenozoic Xenophiles. And you can always visit xenozoicxenophiles.com for links to all of our social media pages. If you like the show, please consider leaving a review on iTunes. It's a great way to help the show get noticed and hopefully attract more listeners. And please consider subscribing to the show so you always know when there's a new episode. If you like the show, please consider trying our other podcast, Trek or Talk About Sci-Fi Bounty Hunter Mercy St. Clair by Ron Randall, and Warlord Worlds, where we cover the comic creations of Mike Grill. In our opinions, these three creators are master storytellers and artists, and we're always happy to talk about their work and hear what others have to say. Thanks for listening, and we hope you will come back next time for another new episode of Xenozoic Xenophiles. Xenozoic Xenophiles is a proud member of the Comics Podcast Network. For more information, please visit comicspodcasts.com. We are not affiliated with Mark Schultz or the various companies that have published the series. The views expressed on the show are solely ours. Music is taken from the album, Movie Tunes, Background Music, Songs and Loops, Volume 2. We make no money from this podcast and no copyright infringement is intended. Xenozoic Xenophiles.